following podcast is a production of Radio Felician, the voice of Felician University and the home of alternative rock done right. Download the Radio Felician app via the Apple app or Google Play stores or stream us 24-7 worldwide at RadioFelician.com. Radio Felician, the Falcon. Welcome to Focus on Senior Living a podcast from the Felician University Institute for Gerontology, exploring the issues that matter to the senior citizen community, talking to experts in fields relevant to seniors, and reminding everyone that things can get better with age. Your host is Dr. Marie Cuman, professor of nursing at Felician University and director of the Felician Institute for Gerontology. Felician University is located in New Jersey with two campuses in Lodi and Rutherford. This is Focus on Senior Living. Hi, I'm Dr. Marie Cuman, and this is Focus on Senior Living. Today, my guest is Dr. Ann Guillory, who is a full professor here at Felician University, and I'm pleased to recognize her as one of my colleagues, and she comes to us as an expert in gerontology. Anne has her doctorate of education from Teachers College in Columbia University. Her master's is also in gerontology, and her bachelor's is in secondary education from Loyola University of the South. She is currently in our Master's of Art in Counseling Psych program and has been in this position since 2014. In 2018 and 2019, she was co-chair of the Institute of Gerontology. Anne is affiliated with many organizations, some of which include the American Association of Gerontology and Higher Education, the Gerontological Society of America, the New Jersey Society on Aging. She also was on the Minority Concerns Committee of the Superior Court of New Jersey and is also a member of the American Society on Aging. She has been a presenter for many senior groups in the New York metropolitan area, and particularly in Bergen County, and was also a reviewer for a textbook on aging from Sage Publishers. Welcome, Ann. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kuman. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I love sharing information. I um, love teaching. Um, I love, I'm very passionate about gerontology uh, based upon the fact that uh, my grandmother was always old, and we lived with her, <laughs> and um, I never really saw that as a deficit in any way. Um, she was an old in the terms of uh, what it looked like in 1950s to be old. She didn't color her hair. She wore a 22 and a half uh, size dress. She wore foot saver shoes, and she had a mind as sharp as a tack. So... Um, that's the lady I grew up around, so I never really understood what dementia or um, any types of other slowing down was all about. So she was my incentive to do gerontology. So let's uh, elaborate on that and focus on the joy and grow and challenges of growing old today. Because based on your background, you have seen and studied a lot of changes related to ageism and growing old in the U.S., Can you kind of outline what you see as your perceptions on growing old? Well, one of the major factors that's there is that um, we start to age the day we're born. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have now established certain stereotypes around um, age cohorts, age groupings, to say, oh, well, you're over the hill at 40. Well, as people started living longer, we're like, well, maybe you're not over the hill at 40. And then we started saying, well, 50 is the new 40. And um, we started giving all these new definitions. But the bottom line is that we start aging the day we're born. And how we deal with the changes that are taking place becomes very critical. First of all, the biology of aging, our health Um, One of the biggest problems in terms of the handicaps that can be associated with aging is caused by obesity. It's also caused by diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol. And those are are, uh, conditions that are largely related to our diets. Uh, The United States has a huge problem with obesity. And um, we 
don't really do too much about it. Now, in the uh, biology of aging studies that are coming out, we're talking a lot about gut health and what is the impact upon our bodies and as how our bodies change as we live longer. Now, that information, Anne, is really important, especially in February, which is Healthy Heart Month, because a lot of those problems you identified, the obesity, the cardiac issues, do have a strong impact on how we age. Yes, it has a, a very strong impact, and particularly upon women and particularly upon minority women. Um, the studies are finding that if a um, female, when she's pregnant, has problems with high blood pressure and diabetes, it is very likely that after the pregnancy that those um, conditions will reoccur. Now, why is it so prevalent in women and minorities as compared to men? Well, health dispar disparities are there. I mean, we've been talking about it, COVID and mm -hmm. various other conditions. But um, the heart health um, has some type of hormonal association with it. Um, if you remember, you know, 30 years ago, it was very um, popular for women to take estrogen as a um, assistance with going through menopause. Uh, because what happens with menopause is that your estrogen level goes down. So they would give the estrogen. Then dramatically, Peter Van Brigham came out with this study that said that um, uh, estrogen, taking estrogen was causing cervical cancer in women. And I mean, it stopped like <laughs> that day. <laughs> the mm -hmm. report came out and the doctors were like, okay, no more prescriptions. So... Um, but it has something to do with the estrogen, but also the fact that people, diet-wise, we don't watch what we're eating, and we're doing a lot of damage before it starts to show up in us as a symptom. Do you also feel that women and minorities are not diagnosed because their symptoms are atypical or different than men? Yes, very much so. Uh, even with the women, by the time they show up with the heart attack, their symptoms are different from uh, uh, male symptoms, mm -hmm. um, particularly that it may not necessarily be the pain in the chest. It may be a pain in the shoulder. And um, people don't recognize it. Oh, I pulled my shoulder. That's what it is. The shortness of breath even. Oh, well, I was running. You know, I'm not what I used to be. Um, we're also noticing that um, the after effects of having COVID. Um, there was the dispute that the COVID vaccine was going to cause myocarditis uh, in individuals. But we're finding that the people who did have COVID, um, regardless of whether or not they had the vaccine, many of them are showing up with myocarditis. And that's been shown by many studies to be a lingering complication yes. of COVID. Yes. And, yeah. and you're right about the misinformation because uh, there was so much misinformation and I also think with COVID, the sedentary lifestyle, because people were mostly in their houses and there was not as much exercise or interaction, probably also increased the possibility. Yes. And, you know, exercise is a factor. Um, we, you know, if we think about going to the mall, mm -hmm. you want to park close to the door. You know, maybe it's a security issue. You know, I don't want to have to walk too far. And so we don't walk. We don't walk in our neighborhoods. Um, maybe the sidewalks are bad or something else. Or I don't want to go to the gym because I might get COVID going to the gym. Um, you know, so you, all these factors are there in terms of prohibiting us from exercise, but exercise is very important. Do you also feel that some of that is also a fear of um, being a victim of violence? Because I know myself, the thought, even though I like, don't mind parking a couple rows away, I'm thinking to myself, well, if I come out in the dark and it's not well lit, I want to be closer. Yeah, that's true. Um, now, I guess maybe about 25 years ago, the National Council on Aging did a study uh, of with the Harris Poll Group mm -hmm. uh, and um, to find out, and it was an adult population, 18 and over. So it went all the way to 100 in terms of the, the people that they um, 
surveyed. And one of the biggest fears uh, was the fear of crime, the fear of disability. And um, everybody thought, oh, well, you know, when you get old, you're afraid to die. That was not their fear. Their fear of loss of independence, their fear of crime um, were way high on the list. Now, we talked about uh, health. One of the things that I also wanted to touch on and that we've spoke about all fair is appearance. Um, we talked about having a president who's 80, who really has a lot of vigor for an 80-year-old and has dispelled a lot of the stereotypes. Do you care to comment on that? Well, I think um, a large factor with him is um, his attitude. He's a fighter. He uh, grew up uh, beginning his life as one who stuttered, which was um, a very difficult stereotype to have to deal with because I'm sure children laughed at him in school and he could he didn't sound like everybody else. So there was a hindrance there. His mother encouraged him in terms of whatever he had to do to battle the, um, the stuttering, and he overcame that. So there are times when you will hear him speak and he relates to the crowd. Um, it relates to the fact that he had a tremendous amount of speech coaching uh, early on in life to teach him how to reach the public. Um, so that's one factor. I'm sure his health is monitored very closely, blood pressure, cholesterol, mm -hmm. all these other kinds of um, health monitors that are there for as we get older. I'm sure that's monitored. And I think attitude um, is a tremendous factor with him that, um, you know, I'm going to make it. You're not going to defeat me. And if you look at the things that he's undergone in life, he had an aneurysm at one point. So he had a surgery for that. Then the loss of his um, wife and his child in the car accident. Then the loss of another child, watching that child die. Um, that's, he's, he's proven he's a survivor. So one of the things I take from what you just said is that as we age, our attitude towards aging is extremely important. Yes, very, very important. Um, you know, you can't be defeated. Um, because who is the manager of yourself? You. Nobody else can do that. Um, I often say in terms of um, your attitude toward self, the only person that you're guaranteed to see every morning in the mirror is you. So what you put into your head about you is very important. This is Focus on Senior Living. So getting back to what you said originally is we start to age the minute we're born. What are some of the attitude adjustments or attitude points that we need to do to have a positive relationship with aging? Well, I think health is a big factor, managing our health, managing our diet, paying attention to what we eat all throughout our lives. Um, you know, uh, I can't tell you the number of people, grandparents that I know that say, oh, the only way that my grandchildren will eat with me is if I go to McDonald's. Sorry, I mentioned McDonald's. But anyway, if I go to, <laughs> go to fast food and we have, uh, you know, chicken nuggets and French fries. Well, that's not really the healthiest thing. The, the chicken probably is loaded with a lot of antibiotics and so forth. Um, so that's one of the things in terms of dealing with your question um, is starting very early on to manage our diets and our exercise and um, not listening to what social media and um, various other forms of uh, communications that's put out there for the public, don't listen to that in terms of what is aging all about. Um, you know, I'm going to bring up this, the issue of uh, Madonna and her appearance at the um, Grammys. You know, the next day, social media was like, oh, my God, did you see what she looked like? Well, she is coping with her own issues of aging and her physical appearance. And she no longer looks like the Adana that we remember with the, um, you know, of the, the material girl or uh, all these other songs that were there. And I guess that was the, uh, the 80s. She doesn't look like that anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's her way of coping with aging. Um, does it change anything? It becomes a lifelong job to tweak 
the um, the collagen injections, the Botox injections, uh, having somebody to manage that. Um, nature does a great job in building us. And going to the pop culture, um, looking at the advertisements for the new movie, 80 for Brady, I look at Sally Field, who has allowed herself to have the salt and pepper hair and and to look her age. And that can be contrasted by someone who, like you said, get the Botox and the cosmetics, that we don't have many good models on how to age gracefully. Men can do it, I think, a lot easier than women. But I think on both sides, you don't have that those good role models sometimes to kind of say, wow, this is how we should do it. Right. Um, the uh, AARP publishes a uh, bulletin and also a magazine on uh, a bi-monthly basis. They alternate. And one of the, the um, articles that they come out with every year is, uh, every month, I'm sorry, every publication is uh, the Big Five O. So some of those people who age um, gracefully, Ellen Burstyn who is 90 yeah. years old now. Oh, wow. I didn't realize she was that old. Yeah. <laughs> we don't realize now, it. Now, for uh, our audience, just mention some of the things. She's an actress? She's an actress. Um, she was in The um, she was in the Exorcist. Um, I don't remember all the other things that she was in, but um, Cheetah Rivera from West Side Story. Oh, I love her. She's 90. So um, she's still out there. I'm not saying she can do the rocket kicks, but she's still out there, very active, still finding roles that um, she can do well. Um, so that's another person. She was just in West Side Story. Yeah, that, the movie. The movie right. that came like, mm-hmm. was out, I think, a year or two years ago. Yeah, and she changed her role. She was no longer the um, younger person. She was the older person mm-hmm. in it, but she was still able to... Um, do a great job with doing that. Um, Jude Law is, uh, they feature him. He's not 90, he's 50. But we look at Jude Law and we're like, you know, he can't be 50, but he is. But you bring up a good point that 50 seems to be the beginning of what we perceive as being an older adult or aging now in America. Mm -hmm. Um, It used to be closer to the 40s, it is aging up, but... We now look at 50 as you're now qualified for senior discounts in some places. What do you think of that trend? I think it's a trend that may change. Um, The baby boomers were born 1946 through 1964. And as the baby boomers, we, Mm -hmm. enter um, into later years, there are going to be a lot of benchmarks that were there that are going to be changed. Mm -hmm. Um, I think even the retirement age may be addressed again. It's going to be unpopular to do it, but I think that will be addressed again. We've already said that people born um, after a certain date, they really can't have that Social Security retirement till 70. They may push it to 75. I wouldn't be surprised either in terms of based on the number of people that will be eligible for it and the limitations in funding. But I also do think there's a trend that people aren't as ready to retire at 65 that I've noticed that people are pushing it back closer to 70 um, because they're still mentally and physically able to do the work and just aren't ready to kind of sit home and just do nothing. Making the adjustment to not having a job is a big adjustment because we have a certain portion of our identity that's associated with work, mm-hmm. right? No matter what the work is. I go to, if I'm a working person, I go to work every day. So what do I do? It'll be great that the alarm clock goes off and I don't have to get up. But how long is that going to last? What do I then do? And our generation of women, we were the first women that actually held jobs outside the home for longer periods of time and weren't as traditional stay-at-home moms as the generations that preceded us. So that being tied up, your identity being tied up with work, 
is part of both male and female now, where it was a traditionally male role in the mm-hmm. past. And even in schools, we don't teach home economics anymore. So we mm-hmm. don't teach sewing. We mm-hmm. don't teach cooking. Um, so for us to stay home and even cook for ourselves, we're looking to go and get the microwave meals that take three and a half minutes to do. Um, we're not going to sit there and cook all day. Well, I don't, I don't want to do that. You know? We don't know how to manage our non-work time. And I think that's a really good observation because as you transition from that work life into retirement, which is, again, associated with aging, it's a very difficult transition sometimes. Yeah. And I think our parents uh, were much better at making the adjustment to the kind of senior years because they were the senior centers where you could go and get a meal every day for $2. Mm -hmm. You could play bingo. You could take the bus ride to Atlantic City. And the baby boomers don't necessarily want to do that. I have a lot of friends that have retired 62, 65, and will not go to the senior center in town which is an extremely active, uh, you see more of the 75 and Mm -hmm. older, particularly those in their 80s that tend to gravitate towards that. Yes, that's true. And so that's cohort related. Mm -hmm. It may also change, as I said, because that baby boomer group, we have changed everything as we age, as we get older, everything we walked into, we changed. Okay. Before the baby boomers, there was no Disneyland. There was no um, convertible cars. The record industry took off. There are many that believe that were it not for the large population of young people that were around during the Vietnam protests, um, that that wouldn't have taken place. The Vietnam protests wouldn't have taken place. Um, the onset of the pill that came with the baby boomers. Um, so sexuality and sexual behavior changed at that point. Not that women weren't using some type of birth control before, but this now became very prevalent so that we changed that. And then certainly, you know, you had the Gloria Sinems mm-hmm. and the Betty Friedan. Some people don't know who that is. You can Google their names. <laughs> and uh, But those were women who talked about women's rights and women's equality and um, I remember I was at a book signing for Betty Friedan, and I said, I, I gave her her book to sign, and she said, uh, I said, she says, what do you want in the book? I said, oh, just sign your name. She says, what is your name? I'm putting your name in the book. And I was like, oh, okay, that's my name. <laughs> but, but that was her thing. She was there to talk about empowering Older women, it was actually a gerontology uh, conference that I was attending. She was way before her time uh, and and a trailblazer because, like I stated earlier, um, our generation was able to work outside the household. It became much more acceptable to hold a job and even things like put your children in daycare or hire help in your house to raise your kids. Before that, that was not acceptable. It wasn't. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, that as the baby boomers get older, I think also we're going to see changes in long term care. What Um, what changes do you anticipate there? Because that is an industry that needs major, major changes. Yeah. Well, it's a it's a business to start off with. So we've got to figure out a way to bridge that um, relationship between business making money and uh, human services. But the baby boomers are not going to go willingly to the um, nursing home if they can af- you know, afford not to go there um, because I'm not gonna be locked up. I'm not gonna lay in that bed like that. I'm not gonna do that. It's not gonna be me. I don't know what's going to be the alternative. I always look to Congress and their experiences, then they say, well, we're not going in that nursing home. So, you know, we got to change things. So I'm looking to them to change some of this because um, we can't exist the way we, we've done. I mean, COVID was a huge um, example of how poor the whole situation is because you had AIDS who were six weeks trained to come in and basically be the 
sole um, companions of these people in nursing homes, and they were going from one shift to another shift at a different facility. And many of them were the carriers of, of the COVID. And they once they got to these places, there wasn't properly, proper, um, you know, masks, gowns, gloves, in order for them to be able to work with that population. We don't put the resources needed there. And they, to me, nursing home, the traditional nursing home still is very institutionalized. It, it's, I separate that from an assistant living where you have an apartment, you're fairly independent still, but um, a nursing home still has that institution about it. And it's, it's not well run. Oh, well, we had the recent case where the, the lady, they said she was dead in the nursing home, mm-hmm. and they brought her to the funeral parlor, and the, fun- the funeral director said, she's not dead, she's breathing. But, Ann, just to stay on that topic, do you see children taking their parents in and, and being able to care for their parents? Because as we continue to age and live longer, is it realistic for a 60-year-old to be caring for their 80- and 90 year old parents? Well, I don't know that they'll be able to do that because they're still working. Mm-hmm. So, um, But aging in place is going to be something that is there as part of a discussion. Um, I think we are still going to have to deal with human services um, as a factor. Um, we need more people to, to be AIDS, to be able to help. Um, mm-hmm. the, uh, the to be able to provide the service in the home. But I think that there that's going to be a factor coming up in terms of will people be actually going into the nursing home? Will we be able to take care of our, our parents? Um, I did it for my mother for two and a half years. She had a peg feed and a trach. Um, so I basically made a hospital room on the first floor of my house. And um, I did... Fortunately, my mother had enough income that I could use her money to pay for a, a full-time. Um, well, she was from seven. She was seventy-seven. I, and I, I was the other seventy-seven. You were seven, yeah. So, um, but I was fortunate in that respect that I did have the finances, and I paid her on the books. Um, it wasn't where I was trying to, you know, not pay what was a reasonable mm-hmm. wage, and um, it was a lot. Um, but it, I knew I could not stay there and take care of my mother all day. I couldn't do that. My, we just had lunch with friends and my girlfriend cares for her father 24 seven with live in help, which is running her close to $70,000 a year. Mm -hmm. That is not a burden that many families can take on. Again, she works full time. Her husband works full time. Um, and she did this, her, her father's actually 102. Uh, she did this because this was her way of handling it, and she does not want to put him in a nursing home. So it's, it's very difficult choices to make and um, because we don't have the resources here in, the, in this, or they're not put in the home, they're put in institutions. The, it's not, um, it becomes very difficult for families to cope with. Yeah. Joan Erickson, uh, the uh, wife of Eric Erickson, the um, psychosocial um, psychologist, speaks about the fact that we put people away. Um, you know, we don't know how to deal with it as part of a family setting. We have to put them someplace out. And she says how off-putting that is, even in terms of age ageism that, you know, you ride out to a rural area mm-hmm. and suddenly there's this big, you know, 500-bed institution. Who lives like that? You know, we don't even have orphanages <laughs> like that anymore. We so got away how, from that. Yeah. So here we are, 500 older people. You know, we had the situation, again, during COVID, where the, they were dying so rapidly. The manager of the nursing home had a large refrigerator mm-hmm. truck in the backyard with all these people that he was just putting back there in plastic bags that they had died with COVID. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we we have to address that. She's she's very good about talking about that. She said, you know, we prepare for kindergarten. We prepare for uh, going to college. We prepare for getting married, our first job, our first apartment. But we don't prepare for getting older. But I'm going to circle back that 
it's also us as a society that we have not made working with older adults attractive. Mm-hmm. And people find people just don't want to work with an older adult. They they don't see the value in that. The money is not in that to be realistic. So if you're going for a college education, you want to be able to go and make decent money and we'll, with what we're paying people who care for our older adults, it's kind of a disgrace. That's true. And, you know, in terms of dealing with these, um, the jobs, the, the being the caretaker, also the amount of education that should go along with that, knowing what is normative behavior for somebody who is over 75, who's living alone, who may have some type of handicap, um, what are their limitations? What is their um, psychological issues that they may have because of loneliness, that they're depressed? Um, the, change, the physical changes that take place with their taste buds. Mm-hmm. As we get older, our taste buds change. Um, I had someone to tell me recently, I didn't realize that uh, you lose brain cells every time you drink a whole lot. And it's, yeah, that happens you know, over a lifetime. So again, back to that point of aging starts the day you're born. We have to start taking care of and and looking at these things. Also norm, knowing what normative aging is all about mentally. You know, the minute I forget something, oh my God, this is Alzheimer's. <laughs> um, you know, or, uh, you know, if, a, a, again, a Joan Erickson uh, reference, she says, if a child forgets their sweater at school, you say, oh, my God, you forgot your sweater again. Mm-hmm. If you have an older person who forgets their sweater um, at the doctor's office or whatever, oh, my God, you forgot your sweater? What happened to your memory? You, you're forgetting things. So, you know, we immediately, we started going. And John Paul Sartre talks about that self-fulfilling prophecy, mm-hmm. that we, we start the, the fire going, and then the person says, well, maybe I am becoming forgetful. Mm-hmm. You know, the first time somebody confuses salt and sugar, it's like you didn't know you put the the <laughs> um, the the salt in the coffee. You know, you didn't realize that. Well, the two of them were there in the bowls, and you know, no. Oh my God, you, you know? can't be absent-minded anymore. No, you can't be absent-minded anymore because everybody's watching. Mm-hmm. But I love your point about. No, the education needs to be improved as to, because I know dealing with a 90, my my father is 92, that trying to keep him socialized and entertained becomes quite difficult. And what do you do to make him, not make him, to keep him active, alert, and stimulated? That walk is Mm -hmm. going to be very important, be it with a walker, be it even if you um, put him in a wheelchair and, you know, roll him um, up and down the block, mm-hmm. uh, getting out, getting fresh hair, um, that, that life is still going on. Your life may be slowing up in some aspects, but the world is still moving. And you need to know that and be a part of that because that's what living's all about. So that's a factor. Um, also, um, if there's music that he likes, I'm going to pitch my movie again. Alive Inside. I love it. Anybody, it's a documentary. You can get it on Netflix um, or you can get it on YouTube. I think it costs $2 to rent it. Um, absolutely fabulous. The value of music in in reviving our memories. And it's your playlist. It's not, it's Dr. Cumin's playlist. It's Dr. Cumin's playlist. Dr. Guillory's playlist is Dr. Guillory's playlist. We like different things. We like different music. And music brings up memories. That's so true. You know, um, the other night, I didn't even, the whole thing with Madonna, I I was not impressed. I, I didn't, you know, it wasn't the world. It didn't stop the world for me. What stopped the world for me was to see Stevie Wonder get up and jam with the rest of the people that were there on that stage. Um, you know, I, I was just like, oh, my God, it's Stevie. I mean, literally, I was upstairs. I ran downstairs to the kitchen <laughs> to, to go see <laughs> Stevie Wonder. So, um, you know, so that will turn me on mm-hmm. when my dementia, you know, starts to set in, if it does, which it could start to set in because of cardiovascular reasons, right? I could have, um, you know, 
my arteries may be starting to block up. So anyway, but the bottom line being that music, playing music for your father, but his music, Mm -hmm. something from a part of his life. Um, that will bring things back. Yes, classical music's great. I got that, I, you know, to soften the mood and so forth. But something that he remembers from when he was a teenager, um, even a, a lullaby that perhaps was when he was, you know, little, he remembers that. So it's those kinds so the music and also puzzles. You got to do puzzles. <laughs> we hate them, but do the puzzles. Get the table, get the puzzles, sit there and try to, to do puzzle big pieces if there's a vision problem get a big piece puzzle sudoku um large word um crossword puzzles large print um c- crossword puzzles you got to keep the brain going and they say I, I put it down i can't sit there with it fine then we'll come back to it later you're listening to focus on senior living a podcast from the felician institute for gerontology what other advice would you give us in terms of growing old gracefully? Well, um, certainly I go back to diet and uh, gut health, paying attention to that. Hydration, and that is can be a challenge because if you drink a lot of water, you have to go to the bathroom a lot also. But knowing that our, our tissues need that hydration. Mm-hmm. So um, watching our diet, hydration, and it's very important. Um, taking that walk every day, even if it's only in your house where you walk up and down, doing that to keep your um, joints moving, to keep your muscles moving, and also in terms of your listening to the music, that's wonderful, and also your mental stimulation. Try to learn something new. If it's a language, if it's um, how to crochet or something, Challenge yourself. I'm going to do something new. That's great advice. Thank you for being such a great guest. And we've really enjoyed this time listening to you and your reflections on aging. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. I love sharing. So thank you, Dr. Kuman. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. This podcast has been a production of Radio Felician, the voice of the Franciscan University of New Jersey. Visit us anytime at RadioFelician.com. Want to send an email? Reach out at radiostation at felician.edu. Radio Felician, the Falcon.